Hey, Pastor Don Spivey here. Thanks so much for tuning in today and downloading or streaming this message. I pray that the Lord uses it to grow you in your faith. Here's a couple of things I want to run by you before we get started. First off, I pray that as you consume this material, it will be a supplement to your growth in the Lord. I also pray that you won't use it as a replacement for gathering together with your church family in person for worship. Secondly, if you are looking for a church home, I'd love to meet you and answer any questions that you might have. You can text the word online to 352-822-3878. That's online to 352-822-3878. Now friends, as we listen to God's word being preached, my prayer is that our hearts will be stirred. Our love and affection for Jesus will grow deeper and deeper. That's my prayer for you and for myself. God bless you. Have a great day. Well, it sounds good out there. Sounds like you actually kind of like each other. And you know, the running joke has been, um, my prayer is that uh, this is not the first time uh, this morning that we've talked to anybody. And so I pray that is not the case. So uh, today uh, we're going to jump right back into the book of Acts. We've been in Acts for almost a year. In two weeks from now, I believe it is, in two and a half weeks from now, it'll be one year that we've been going through the book of Acts. Now, we did not, you know, jump into Acts last week because um, my daughter got married last weekend, and I was just really just needed to rest. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Um, my goodness. I, I should have gotten lots of advice from the dads of daughters here. Uh, that would have helped me a lot because it, it's just a, a unique sense of joy and happiness for your daughter. And then like this this sense of loss at the same time. Does anybody resonate with that? Yeah, my goodness. I, I, I love that kid. I heard a comedian this week say that when my son was born, um, I, I knew that I would die for him. But when my daughter was born, I'd kill for her. <laughs> and then he went on to say, he said, uh, I wouldn't kill for my wife because that's her dad's job. I just love that kid, and man, it was just a beautiful time, beautiful wedding, uh, great time together. Uh, I missed y'all last week, and so I'm looking forward to jumping back in to Acts. We'll be in Acts chapter 27. Um, we are going to be um, uh, uh, ambitious this morning, okay, ambitious. We're going to cover chapter 27 all the way to chapter 28, verse 16. We're going to do our best. We may not make it there, and that's okay. Amen? All right. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever been on a cruise? Yeah. Do you like cruises? I've heard, uh, ooh, I, that's, a mixed, that's a mixed bag right there. Um, I've heard some terrible cruise stories from people within our congregation, uh, and I've heard some great cruise stories. Uh, a cruise. Um, my, my dad spent a lot of time on, a, on an aircraft carrier. My father-in-law spent a lot of time on one as well. And my father-in-law was just straight up said, I, I've spent too much time on a boat. I am not going on a cruise. Well, today we're going to look at a cruise per se, but not a fancy cruise, not, not a luxury liner, but we're going to look at the cruise, the, the sailing, the ship, uh, the, the journey that Paul takes from Caesarea to Rome. Now, if you remember and you've been tracking along with this sermon series, um, Paul said early on that he was headed to Rome. And we know from the book of Romans that he's actually wanting to use Rome as a jumping off point to get to Spain. Why is all of this important? Well, because this last year we celebrated 100 years as a, as a church congregation. And uh, that's a beautiful thing. But really, we're 2,000 years old. Because this is the story, this is the narrative and acts of the gospel going to uh, the, the ends of the earth. And friends, we're part of the ends of the earth. We're here. And if you're here this morning and you claim Jesus Christ as your Savior and you love Christ, uh, you do so because the gospel message traveled to the ends of the earth. And as a church that has been around for 100 years, it cannot stop on our watch. It cannot stop. The progression of the message of Christ uh, going forth cannot stop on our watch. We will not drop the baton. As long as I'm here, and I pray, Lord willing, I'll be here uh, for, I don't know, whenever. Maybe I'll preach my funeral, and I don't know, something like that. 
But Lord willing, I, I, it will not stop with us. Uh, it will continue to push forward into dark places. Dark places because without the light of Christ. So Acts 27 is going to get us there. Uh, to Rome. Acts 27 and into Acts 28 gets Paul to Rome. Now, a couple of things before we go much further. There are two things I really want you to, to, to grasp right here. Um, throughout history, uh, there have been what you might call the, the liberal side of things and then maybe the, um, uh, uh, amb- I don't know, ambitious side of understanding this, this section. Um, Imagine, imagine that there's a line, okay? There's a line running straight. We, we don't want to be below the line when it comes to interpreting Scripture. We don't want to be below the line, and we don't want to be above the line, okay? Now, what I'm saying is there are some scholars that would have looked at Acts 27 here and have said that Dr. Luke, Luke who penned on the Gospel of Luke and who penned Acts, that Luke took stories from other narratives and pulled it in together to kind of embellish Paul's journey. Um, maybe, you know, some have said that he pulled it from Homer or what have you. Um, I, I don't think that's the case. And, and I don't because it is so specific. It is so descriptive. It is written like a firsthand account. And also um, that, that we know that God had told Paul that he's going to Rome. Um, we, we also know that throughout history that this account in Acts 27 has been used by secular scholars to understand what, what traveling on the sea was like in the ancient world. Uh, it was, it's been used as a historical um, document to, to understand what they would be going through. But the other, the other um, more, I think, even more pressing uh, for most of, most of our churches and myself and, and other preachers is to take this story and what you might call allegorize it. Okay, and we've all heard some allegorizing. I don't know, is that a word, allegorizing? It is today. It is today. You can make up your own words, so it's fine. That's what we do with this culture now. We just make up words, change the definitions, all that stuff. Nonetheless, um, allegory would be kind of reading into the text, Okay, so for example, there are a lot of sermons out there um, when, when you we get here and they've put the anchors down. Um, there are a lot of preachers that have said, well, that, those anchors represent um, unbelievers and their, and their decisions in life. Maybe one of them is, is their own hard work and maybe one of them is their, their reasoning. And, and, and they take the anchors and, and they make it all these things. Some, some people have taken when the boat is, is breaking up to pieces and the, and the sailors and the Prisoners are trying to get to the shore of Malta. Um, they're floating on planks. They're swimming, all this stuff. They have allegorized all kinds of things into this story. Here's the deal. Anchors are anchors. Boats are boats. Waves are waves. Please, please, don't fall into the trap on this narrative or any other places in Scripture of allegorizing the text. And here's a phrase that I came across a while back, and I thought it would be helpful for us. Um, it'll be up on the screen. It just basically says that the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. Does that make sense? The main things, well, the main thing is the plain thing, and the plain thing is the main thing. And so when we come to Scripture, we look to see what did it mean? You know, what is said here? Um, Luke is writing for a specific reason, a specific purpose right into a specific audience. Now we look at that, and then we bring application to our lives. Now, there's some great application throughout this. But again, anchors are anchors. Ropes are ropes. The dinghy behind the ship is just the dinghy behind the ship. We all follow me? Okay, that didn't sound convincing, but we'll go. All right. What we're going to see here, um, because we know what God has promised Paul is going to happen, Paul knows without a shadow of a doubt he is going to Rome. And if you remember where we were previously, um, Paul has spoken to Agrippa, and he presented his case, and, um, and 
and others, and he has appealed to Rome because he's technically a Roman citizen. And now, um, not only has God promised that he's going to get there, uh, Rome's going to pay the way. <laughs> so Rome's going to take care of it. But he is a prisoner on this ship. And you'll see as we go through here, he's a prisoner with a lot of freedom, lots of freedom uh, to, to move and to interact. What I also want us to remember, we use this word some, you know, around here sometimes, God's sovereignty. God is in control of all things. Let me introduce another word that you may or may not be familiar with. God, his providence, the providence of God. And what, is, what is providence? We're not going to see it in the text, but I believe that we see it playing out through the text. What is providence? Providence comes from two Latin words. Pro means forward or on behalf. And vide, which means to see. So providence ultimately means to supply what is needed to give sustenance or support. Applying that to God is this. The act of purposely, purposefully providing for or sustaining and governing the world. God is in control, and in his providence, he is going to sustain his control. He is going to get Paul to where he needs to be, where he is supposed to go. And providence uh, is very much at play in all of our lives. But we're also going to see this, that there is a, a, a narrative of weaving together God's providence and human responsibility. That we come to this, uh, that we have responsibility to, to act, to, to do. And Paul does that throughout here. Now, on the way to Rome, they're headed out. Rome is the center of the world at this time. Rome is the center of political influence. It's the center of power. It is the place to be if you're going to influence the rest of the world. And actually, going all the way back to Acts 1-8, again, this is the ends of the earth. And then the message of Christ propels on from there. Now, also, as we read here in just a moment, I want you to pay attention to Paul's relationships. He has relationships with Christians and relationships with pagans. And how he interacts, I think we can learn a lot from that. We may not fully get to the end of that type of that idea today. We'll pick it back up next week. We'll see. His, his interaction with fellow believers and his interaction with people who are not believers. So Christians and pagans. So pay attention to his relationships. Now let's pick up. We're going to read all the way through, and then we'll come back and talk about it for a little bit. Um, the words will also be up on the screen, but if you have a copy of God's Word, um, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 27. When it was decided that we were to sail to Italy, they handed over Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion named Julius of the Imperial Regiment. When we had boarded the ship, a ship, uh, a ship of Adramidium, we put to sea, intending to sail to ports along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to receive their care. When he had put out to sea uh, from there, we sailed along the north, northern coast of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And after sailing uh, through the open sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we reached Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing, um, sailing, I'm sorry, there the Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. Sailing slowly for many days, we, with difficulty, we arrived at Snidus. And since the wind did not allow us to approach it, we sailed along the south side of Crete of Salmone. Uh, with still more difficulty, we sailed along the coast and came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lysa. And by now, much time had passed, and the voyage was already dangerous. Since the Day of Atonement was already over, Paul gave his advice and told them, Men, I can see that this voyage is headed toward disaster and heavy loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid attention to the captain and the owner of the ship rather than to what Paul said. And since the harbor was unsuitable for, to winter in, the majority decided to set sail from there, hoping somehow to reach Phoenix, a harbor on Crete, facing the southwest or northwest, and to winter there. When a gentle south wind sprang up, they thought they had achieved their purpose. 
And they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. But before long, a fierce wind called the, called the Northeaster um, rushed down from the island. Since this ship was caught and unable to head into the wind, uh, we gave way to it and were driven along. After running, after running under the shelter of a little island called Cauda, uh, we were barely able to get control of the skiff. And after hoisting it up, they used, they used ropes and tackle and girded the ship, fearing they would run aground on the Sirtis. They lowered the drift anchor, and in this way, they were driven along. Because we were beginning um, severely beaten by the storm, they began to jettison the cargo the next day. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard and with their own hands. And for many days, neither sun nor stars appeared, and the severe storm kept raging. Finally, all hope was fading that we would be saved. And since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, You men should have followed my advice not to sail from Crete and sustain this damage and loss. Now I urge you to take courage, because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. For last night, an angel of, God, of the God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take courage, men, because I believe God that it will be just the way it was told to me. But we have to run aground on some island. Verse 27. When the 14th night came, we were drifting in the Adriatic Sea. And about midnight, the sailors thought they were approaching land. They took soundings and found it to be 120 feet deep. When they had sailed a little farther and sounded again, they found it to be 90 feet deep. Then fearing we might run aground uh, on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern. And prayed for daylight to come. And some sailors tried to escape from the ship. They had let down the skiff into the sea, pretending that they were going to put out anchors from the bow. And Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes holding the skiff and let it drop away. When it was about daylight, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been waiting and going without food, having eaten nothing. So I urge you to take some food, for this is for your survival, since none of you will lose a hair from your head. And after he had said these things and had taken some bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them. And after he broke it, he began to eat. They were all encouraged and took food themselves. And in all, there were 276 of us on the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing grain overboard into the sea. Verse 39. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but sighted a bay with a beach. They planned to run the ship ashore if they could. And after cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea at the same time, loosening the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and headed for the beach. But they struck a sandbar and ran the ship aground. The bow jammed fast and remained immovable while the stern began to break up by the pounding of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that no one could swim away and escape. But the centurion kept them from carrying out their plan because he wanted to save Paul. And so he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to follow, some on planks and some on debris from the ship. In this way, everyone safely reached the shore. Everybody take a breath. All right, chapter 28. We're going to go 16 verses. Here we go. Once safely ashore, we then learned that the island was called Malta. And the local people showed us extraordinary kindness. They lit a fire and took us all in since it was raining and cold. As Paul gathered a bundle of brushwood and put it on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. And when the local people saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to one another, This man, no doubt, is a murderer. Even though he escaped the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But he shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no harm. And they expected that he would begin to swell up or suddenly drop dead. And after they waited a long time and saw nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said, He was a god. Now in the area around that place, 
was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitality for three days. Publius' father was in bed suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went to him and praying and laying, hands, laying his hands on him, he healed him. And after this, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So they heaped many honors on us, and when we sailed, they gave us what we needed. And after three months, we set sail in an Alexandrian, Alexandrian ship that had wintered at the island with the twin gods as its figurehead. And put it in at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, after making a circuit along the coast, we reached Regium. After one day, a south wind sprang up, and the second day, we came to um, Putali. There we found brothers and sisters and were invited to stay a week with them. And so we came to Rome. Now the brothers and sisters from there had heard the news about us and had come to meet us as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered, when we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Thank the Lord for his word. I, I hope you see the things that we've already mentioned, that the relationships are, are very, very much prevalent, the relationships between um, Christians and pagans, and how Paul interacts with them. First off, you see Aristarchus. Aristarchus we see elsewhere in the book of Acts, and then it says that Aristarchus was with us. Who's the us? Well, that is Luke. Luke is writing into the story himself. He's there, not writing into himself. He is there firsthand. And that's why you see such detailed um, accounts all the way through. And, you know, some have said over the years that the New Testament is just folklore. It's, it's, ancient, it's ancient fiction writing. And I remember reading that C.S. Lewis said that is not the way that you would write ancient folklore. This is written such as the Gospels, they're all written as first-hand accounts, first-hand experience. And that's not how ancient literature was written. And some of you have been in classes in college or uh, in high school where you had to read some ancient literature that did not have a whole lot of detail in it, such as maybe Beowulf. <laughs> or you know, if you're a fan of Beowulf, I'm sorry. I offended you. But I was make sure you're awake. Um, this is not written like that. This is written with much detail and much firsthand account. And so you see how, how these, these Christians, they, they, he, he gets to the land and uh, he's allowed to go stay with them. And why is he going to stay with them? It says that, that they're to um, encourage him and to help him. Um, and then we, again, we see when they get to Rome, there's these Christians uh, there that are ready to help him. And then as he's on the ship, we see these pagans and how much influence Paul has with them. And how he's able to um, lead and, and to encourage and to, and to um, strengthen them. And we even see that when he gets to Malta, when he gets to Malta, the, the people in Malta think he's, he's, he's a murderer because he got bit by a snake. Well, you know, he didn't die in the sea, so obviously he's a murderer because he just got bit by a snake. And then he doesn't die, so well, now he must be a god. It's almost like our culture today. We're just all over the place. James said something about being tossed to and, th to and fro by every wind of doctrine. It's just like we're all over, all over the place. But we also see that he goes to the house of the leading man of the island. And it made me think when I heard somebody say it like this. If I'm never invited to a lost person's home, maybe my circle of friends is too narrow. Think about that. If I'm never invited to, to hang out with somebody who doesn't follow Christ, maybe, maybe I need to widen my circle and meet some people. So we see this juxtaposition, I think, between the two. Now we're going to outline it like this, okay? We're going to outline it like this. We'll, we'll, it'll all be on the screen for a moment. Um, we're going we're gonna to go all aboard, all right? And then we're going to go all change, and then we're going to go all over, and then we're going to say, it's all right, and maybe we'll get to all arrive. I doubt we get that far. Here we go. Let's talk about all aboard. Verses 1 through 6 in chapter 27. 1 through 6. Um, we've, we've got, again, all of them coming together. Aristar Aristarchus, um, Luke, they're all there. 
And then we see in verse 3, again, Paul's friends who are taking care of him. Um, and I know that so many times we think of Paul as this superman for the gospel. And God greatly used him. But we have also seen throughout the book of Acts that Paul needed encouragement. He needed people. If, if you remember at the end of 2 Timothy, at the end of Paul's ministry, at the end of Paul's life, he writes these words and he asks that, that people would be sent to him. Uh, he's, he does need encouragement. And it is good and it is okay if you and I need to be encouraged in the Lord. Uh, Paul definitely seems to be this superman, but we cannot just put him on this pedestal that says he was just um, immune to all of life's issues. I wonder in verse 3, look at verse 3. I wonder, where do these people come from? Where did this church come from? The next day, says, we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to receive their care. Uh, Where did they come from? Most likely, the church formed there because you go all the way back towards the beginning chapters of, of Acts, and what is Paul doing? He is persecuting the church. And the disciples that, at that time were dispersed all around the known world. And most likely, think how, how amazing this is. The people who are welcome him into their home are some of the ones who may have been very much persecuted by Paul in the early days of the gospel. And that is the grace of God. And so we see this all aboard. We also see all change. All change. Verses 6 through 9. Um, look at verse 6. Uh, all change. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. What is an Alexandrian ship? This ship's coming from, uh, this ship's coming from Egypt. And Rome had a contract with Egypt. Egypt would provide the grain for Rome. And this is an Alexandrian ship. Um, with the grain. We see later in this account where the, where the grain is, is dumped overboard. Uh, all change. So there, the prisoners uh, all aboard here, we see also there's 276 of them, uh, and we got Paul. 276 people, and then and along with Paul. And Paul seems to have this unique um, favor with the rest of, with the centurion. Um, a centurion would have been in charge of 100 men. Uh, a legion of men would have been about 6,000 men. And so he was in charge of a hundred men. Now this centurion, very influential, really has a friendship with Paul, or at least a a favor with Paul. What's the deal with these other prisoners? Well, they're going to see the Caesar. Who's the Caesar? Nero, right? Um, In history, you may remember, Nero is is the one who, who fed people to the lions, Nero is the one who persecuted Christians. But there was this thing in Rome where the Colosseum, the games, uh, you've seen this depicted in Hollywood. The movie 300? 300? No. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Uh, you've seen this depicted. And so where do these people who are fighting the lions or, or playing the games to their death, where do these people come from? They're prisoners. We see this in history. They are prisoners from the outlying provinces that are brought to Rome to feed to feed their, their lust and, and, and desire for, for um, entertainment. And so not only are they on a ship that's going to feed them grain, but they're also men on this ship who are going to be fed to the lions. That's what's happening here. And so that's why when they get to Malta and there's a shipwreck uh, and, and the, they're afraid that the prisoners are going to swim away, it's because they were responsible for those prisoners. And if they got away, they could very likely, the, the, um, the soldiers could very likely be held accountable and murdered for those prisoners. And so all of these people coming together, all there. Uh, look at verse 9. Um, by now, much time had passed. By now, much time had passed. Well, we know that traveling the distance that they're going should only take about five weeks. But as we go through this narrative, it's going to be just over four months that it takes to get there. Now time has passed, and the voyage was already dangerous since the Day of Atonement was already over. And Paul gave his advice. So the Day of Atonement would have been held in late September, most likely, or early October. And so basically, this is a well-known fact, that throughout um, the, the area of the sea there, you don't sail after that time period because of the wind and the waves and the storms that would rise up. And so... Verses 6 through 9, all change. Verse, actually, verses 6 through 10. In verse 10, Paul speaks to them. At this time, he speaks from a human 
a human, um, I might say it this way, uh, he, he speaks from human observation. And later he's going to speak from divine revelation. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, he says, uh, well, it says, Paul gave his advice and told them, men, I can see that this voyage is headed toward disaster and heavy loss, not only of the cargo, but the ship, but also of our lives. So here he says, we're not going to make it through this thing. But later he's going to say, we're going to make it through this thing. Human observation says, this is a dumb idea, guys. Later, divine revelation says, God's got us. God's going to take care of us. And I, I don't know about you, but um, it's okay to have human observation. You know, they, 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 they outvote him. I wonder, I wonder if they're like, who is this guy who thinks he knows about the sea? We are people who know about the sea, and we will do what we're going to do. But we also see later in Scripture that Paul has been shipwrecked how many times? Three. Paul, Paul knows a thing or two about the sea, and he knows a thing or two about shipwrecks, and he knows this is a really dumb idea. But he's outvoted, and here they go. And so we also would turn to this idea. It's all over. It's all over. It's all aboard. It's all changed. And now it's all over. Verses 20, starting there and following. Uh, we'll see for many days, in verse 20, for many days neither sun nor stars appeared, and the severe storm kept raging. Finally, all hope was fading that we would be saved. It's all over. All hope was fading. Verse 13, it seemed like everything was good. But suddenly, all hope is fading. Without being guilty of allegorizing, I think we can look at this narrative and see God's, again, God's sovereignty and God's providence to take care of his people to get them where they are supposed to be. And I do believe that we can take that and apply it to our own lives. Are there times, are there, are there situations that you are going through right now, that you are going through where, where you're not sure, or maybe all hope has faded for you today? I want to encourage you by God's word that God is in control. That even though they could not see the stars and the, and the darkness had overcome them, even though all of that, and it might feel like that for you as well, I want you to know that God's in control. I remember uh, when I was a kid, uh, we, were on, um, my, we were on Lake Butler over towards Windermere, and we were on a pontoon boat. And we were going out on this pontoon boat, and it was a beautiful summer day. But just like summer days do in Florida, it turned very, very quickly, and a storm blew up, and we found out later that it was a tornado that had come through, and we're on this pontoon boat just jumping waves. And my dad and everybody thought that it was a good idea to tell all the kids to just lay down on the bow of the boat. That'd be the front of the boat if y'all don't know that. But lay down on the bow of the boat. So why? So it won't keep coming out of the water. I was like, this is a dumb idea. Y'all, all y'all weigh heavier than I do. <laughs> Somebody else can get up here. But storms just spring up, don't they? They call this a northeaster. Uh, it's just, it just a rushing wind. And sometimes in our lives, that is the way it feels, that, that things come against us and we, we don't understand. And in this moment, they are saying it's all over. Aristarchus, who's with them, Aristarchus had faced some persecution along with Paul earlier in the book of Acts. I just wonder if Aristarchus is sitting there saying, oh, here we go again, Paul. Here we go. You done got us into something again. My goodness, man. They're surrounded by mayhem. Look at verse 23. Surrounded by mayhem. This is what Paul is saying. Well, let's go back to verse 22. Now I urge you to take courage because there will be no loss of any of our lives, of your lives, but only of the ship. Verse 23. Surrounded by mayhem. This is what happens to Paul. For last night, an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take courage, men, because I believe God. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe God? Let me ask you this, even, even a bigger question. Do you belong to him? Do you, he says, this is the God I belong to. Do you belong to him? And then he says, this is the God I belong to and serve. 
another probing question. Do I belong to him and do I serve him? Do I believe him? Or is this just some kind of cultural thing that we do? And we gather together on Sundays, and some come every Sunday, and some come on Easter and Christmas, and some come once a month, and some come twice a month, and some come again every Sunday. Is this just, is this just something we do that you grew up doing, or is this something where you would actually say, I belong to this God. I belong Him, I serve Him, and I believe Him. And let me ask you, what are you believing for? What are you trusting in his promise that he's going to provide? What promise is that? The scripture's full of promises. What promise are you trusting in? In Matthew chapter 8, verse 18, is, is the account where the disciples are going to get in the boat and there's a big storm. In Matthew 8, 18, it says this, When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. You see, um, shortly after this, they do get in the boat. And as soon as they get out into, into the ocean, into the sea, as soon as they get out there, a storm blows up on them. And they're being tossed back and forth. And what is Jesus doing, if you're familiar with that section? Uh, Jesus is what? He's asleep. Jesus, do you care about what's happening right now? And they wake him up. And he's like, peace be still. Calms the wind, calms the waves, calms everything down. He says, why have you, well, you, know, you have little faith. What do we know about that account? We know the promise. In verse 18, Jesus said, we're going to the other side. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God will keep his promise? He will get you to the other side. He will get you through this moment. He will get you there. And shortly right after this, it's going to say 14 days later, Paul stands up and says, we're going to be all right, boys. First, before that, he's like, y'all should have listened to me. He did, I don't know. Did he give a little, I told you so, kind of sounds like it. It would have been really hard for me not to say that. I told y'all we should not do this. This is a dumb idea. And here we are. But we're going to get to the other side. And then 14 days later, they're still tossed. They're still being battered. It's still dark. It's still uncontrollable. It's still all over the place. And this is what's happened to them throughout this entire thing. They have lost their bearings because they used the, they used the stars to navigate with. They don't have a GPS in their hands. They're using, they lost their bearings. They have no idea where they're going. They've also lost their appetite. And they've lost their hope. And friends, I'm telling you, as we walk through this life, it is so easy to lose our bearings. It is so easy to lose hope. And like many of us, when we go through difficult times, they're going through difficult times, they're not hungry at all. And Paul will eventually stand up and he says, hey guys, you need to eat some food. You need to have courage. And such respect that he has for these pagans and such respect that they have for Paul, I think is something that is very telling for us. Very telling for us. So all change, all over. First off, all aboard. Let's close it out with this one. All right. Somebody say all right. One of my favorite actors, he always says, all right, all right, all right. All right. In verse 22, he says it's going to be all right. He doesn't, he doesn't chide them or criticize them. It's going to be okay. He comforts them. He says he knows that he's going to, to, to Rome. In verse 27, they're still drifting. I thought you said it was going to be all right. I thought you said it was going to be okay. I thought, you said, I thought you said this was over. No, no. I said it's going to be all right. We're still going through it, but it's going to be all right. There's confidence. There's confidence in C in verse 23. There's such confidence that the God who created him is also the God who owns him. Such confidence. When I was in Bible college, or when I was, yeah, when I was in school, um, we, we'd have to go to chapel every day. Chapel. And some of y'all been there. You know, you went to the Christian school or what have you, and you had to go to chapel. And, and we would get into chapel, and, um, and as, as, as young theologians that we thought we were, we would always like critique everything that the preacher said that day because it was always like a guest preacher. 
So being that I was a guest preacher, we heard a lot of the same illustrations over and over and over again. You ever heard the illustration um, that basically somebody's at a family reunion and they're like, hey, hey, um, don't throw your fork away. Keep your fork. Keep your fork. Why? Because what comes after the main course? Dessert. There's something much better coming. You know, I've heard that story told so many times. And then one day I had a, we had a preacher in chapel who said one day I was at my family reunion and my aunt told me to keep my fork. And we we're all like, Two weeks ago, the other guy said, I heard a story about somebody saying keep a fork. Now you're saying it's your story? And we heard all kinds of illustrations. Here's one of my favorite ones. You ready? Here's one of my favorite ones. In light of what we're saying right here, that, that Paul is created by God, and he's also owned by God. This is a good illustration. You'll remember this one. There's a little boy. There's a little boy that had a little knife, and he carved the boat out of this piece of wood. And he loved that boat. And he set that boat in a little stream by his house. And the stream took the boat, and suddenly it took it so fast, the little boy couldn't get the boat. It was gone. He loved that boat. And now that boat is completely gone. One day, this little boy, he's walking through town, and he walks past a, a, past a store. And in the window front of the store there, he sees his boat. His boat is now for sale at the toy store, the boat that he made is now for sale. And so he runs home. He breaks open his piggy bank. He takes all the money that he has. He goes back to that store and he buys the boat. And as he's walking home, he looks at that boat and he says, I love you and I lost you and I've bought you back. Isn't that a good picture of who we are? I love you. I lost you, but I bought you back. You belong to him. He's made you a promise. You're going to get to the other side. You belong to him. The storm may rage, and it may not stop, but that does not negate the promise of God. Trust in the promise. We have the promise of God that we hold on to and the promise of God that we proclaim. Friends, hang in there. Stay faithful. Stay strong in the Lord. What makes us different in the world around us, what makes us different in the world around us is holding to his promise. We all face the same storms. You're going to face the same and similar storms as your neighbor across the street who may or may not know the Lord. What's the difference? It's what you are, at risk of saying the word, anchored into. (laughs) What are you holding on to? The promise of God, the God whose child I am and whom I serve has promised to bring me safely to the other side. And that is true 100% for you and for me today. Maybe you're going through a difficult time. Trust the promises of God. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'll never give up on you. I'll never run out on you. Why is that? He's a good father. He is a good father. What did Jesus say? He said things like, he knows every hair on your head. And the running joke is always, and the hairs that aren't on your head. He knows the birds. and He feeds them. He clothes the flowers. You don't see them begging. He takes care of them. And he will take care of you. Even though it may be dark. He will fulfill his promise because he's a good father. Let's pray together. Father, you are good. God, you are loving and kind and generous. And Father, you provide. You provide. And we're forever thankful for that, God. We're forever thankful. And God, I know that there are those in the room right now who are battling sickness. Uh, they're, they're, they're battling um, their family being sick. Father, there are people at home right now who would normally be here who are going through some difficult times. And God, I pray that we would be encouraged that even though tomorrow we might have a doctor's appointment that's going to tell us something, that we would still trust and be encouraged by you. That we would hold on to you more than any other report. 
But Father, I pray that we would not lose our bearings. And God, we would not lose hope. God, we trust you. We love you. Your heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment, friends. You might say right now, it's like, I am going through some stuff. I'm going through some stuff. It feels really dark. Would you just pray for me? Would you raise your hand? I'd love to just, just pray for you. You're going through some stuff. You're not alone. You are not alone. God, I pray that you would be blessed. And God, I pray that you would help these men and women walk through those dark times. And I pray that you would encourage. And I pray that you would remind us. Let me ask this question. Do you belong to God? Maybe you don't belong to God. Let me ask you. Do you want to accept, accept Jesus Christ right now to surrender your life to him? Because he's the only one that has the promises that are kept. He's the one that died for your sin and rose again so that you could have peace with God. Maybe that's you today. I want to trust Jesus Christ for the very first time in my life. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to belong to God that's you, would you raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you. Okay. Okay. Father, we trust you. God, we're going to, we're going to sing. God, we're going to respond to how you lead us to respond. Hey there, thanks again for downloading or streaming this message. I pray that the Lord will use it to grow you in your faith. I look forward to meeting you one day soon at one of our worship gatherings. It's impossible for us to recreate online what you'll experience when you gather with us in person for worship. If you have any questions, go ahead and text the word online to 352-822-3878. That's online to 352-822-3878. Look forward to meeting you. God bless. Have a great week.